So in the last video, a bunch of you guys noticed my snack tray mounted bench grinder. And uh, it's actually a pretty good shop tip. I've got a couple of bench grinders mounted on benches here and there. But I use this one over here for when I'm actually doing an engine job or something that needs to be, you know, remain clean. And I've got to do some grinding or I've got to hit something on the wire wheel, something grungy. And it just keeps the mess out of the shop. You can just drag this outside, do whatever you have to do and then bring it back in. So another helpful tip from Uncle Tony. Um, all right, so this time around we want to talk about basic engine prep, basic block prep. Right? The, block is always my, the block has always been my favorite part of any car. I don't know what it is about them. Right? Maybe it's just that it represents so much potential, you know? And the potential is what this is all about. What you get out of one of these things is what you put into it. And if you're going to try to build an engine completely yourself at home using basic tools, which is what we're doing with this thing, um, attention to detail is everything and judgment calls are everything and here's what you have to you know yeah this is you got to put this in your head right you can't just go through the motions when you're doing something like this you can't just say well okay I'll hone it well, okay I'll clean this so no you actually have to pay attention to each step and each part of the engine it is a tedious time-consuming back-breaking task you'll have far more far many more hours into doing it this way than it would cost you to send those to a machine shop and just have it done. Right? But, you know, a lot of you guys are working on a budget, a lot of these are just determined do-it-yourselfers, like me, uh, and you try to do as much as you possibly can by yourself. So, it's impossible to give you a step-by-step -step on how to do your particular engine. You could be working with a Volkswagen engine, you could be working with a Toyota, an AMC, a Chevy, a, a Chrysler like us. And every engine is different. Every engine led a different life. Um, you know, aside from the design characteristics, you know, you could have two completely identical engines that came from two different cars. One was driven by Batman and the other was driven by, old, you know, old lady to and from church every Sunday. So they could have two completely different circumstances that they're, you know, that they existed in. So this is where the paying attention to detail and, uh, and going through the steps really makes a difference. But there are some things that are universal. So let's cover those, right? First, the first is every engine block is gonna have some sort of drain plug like this. Uh, a lot of guys will replace these with, with, a, uh, with a petcock, like the type that you get from a radiator, it's the same thread. So you want to remove these things, and especially on this engine, because we know there was silicone in the water jackets, and there was a lot of evidence of stop leak in the water jackets. So you absolutely want to pull these things and flush out the, uh, the cooling passages. Same thing for freeze plugs. Now here's the thing, right? If you come across an engine that has a brass freeze plug like this, and it's in there and there's no signs of leakage, just leave it alone. They don't rot, they're permanent. If you've got original ones that are steel like this, you definitely want to replace those. Now here's something to notice. Whoever did put this brass freeze plug in here didn't drive it in as far as it should go. See, they're supposed to be recessed a little bit like that. So we're gonna just pop that one in and then we'll replace the steel ones. One of the reasons why if you've got a, a known good freeze plug like one of these in there that you don't want to pull it apart is you'll, you could end up with a situation like this at the back of the block. I don't know if you can see this here. This is a good solid freeze plug, right? I mean, we've, we've, I, I poked it with a, with, a, with a pick and everything, right? Uh, it's fine. This thing is solid. But it had some seepage. And the seepage is because this hole is not completely round. So we're going to knock this out. We'll hit it with a sealer and we'll put a new one in. But that's something you want to be aware of. Every time you, with the core plugs or freeze plugs, every time you knock one out and put one in, you're stretching the metal a bit. Okay. Cam bearings. Now, cam bearings are another judgment call. I have found from experience that when dealing with a completely rebuilt engine with all new bearings, if you're going to have a problem with anything, it's going to be in the cam bearing. You'll see these things grab a hold of the crank, or the, the, the camshaft and spin. You'll see all sorts of things going on with them. And the reason for that is because the cam bearing is one of the few press fit bearings that you're going to find in a block. And the cam bearing is driven in there when the block is brand new and fresh. 
This section of block between the cam and the main saddle is exposed to the most distortion, the most twist, uh, heating and cooling cycles. All things happen to make this relationship between the bearing and the block very unique. As a rule of thumb, if I eyeball these things and I don't see any wear marks, and I don't see any wear marks on these, I will leave them alone rather than take the risk. On, the, on certain engines, changing these things or knocking them out is an absolute necessity. Uh, an example would be an FE Ford because of the, the oil passage that goes behind the bearing. You need to knock these things out and make sure that that oil passage is clear. That oil passage in those engines are extremely critical. And then you've got engines like the Buick V8s, for instance, where instead of having the oil hole at the bottom, they've got them here. And what happens is the cam tries to dry, tries to work itself. The bottom of the bearing has doesn't have direct oiling, and so the the cam bearings will start to wear. You'll find that on on, on very high performance Buick motors, high RPM motors with with big cams, you know, lots of lift, lots of lots of valve spring. That's the weak link. It'll actually tunnel through the bottom of the bearing and start working its way into the block before you realize that it, this thing is toast. So there are some engines that you absolutely positively need to change them. There are some engines that you could just leave them alone. And from my experience, the small block Chevys tend to give the most problems with the cam bearings. Uh, main bearings, it, it, that's a normal replacement part. And again, it's a judgment call. On this one over here, on this engine, we found that the rod bearings showed a lot of copper where the main bearings show no copper at all and they only have some light surface scratching. So we'll just hit these with some Scotch-Brite and reuse them. Um, but we will put new rod bearings in it. What else is there? Oh, okay. Before you start working on the block, you want to give it a basic cleanup. Don't go nuts with it, right? Because you're going to go for the nuts cleanup after you're done with all of your work. All you want to do with this thing is drag it to the car wash or pressure washer, whatever you got to do, hit it with degreaser and just, you know, and a brush and just get all of the, you know, the, the gack off of it. You want to get this thing to where you can handle it and you're not going to get dirty handling it. Um, there's no sense in going crazy cleaning the thing at this stage of the game because when you're done, you're going to have to really give it a good detailed cleaning. So just get it to where it's, it's, acceptable, you know what I mean, where you could just handle it and you don't have grease and gack and everything else falling all over it. And then you get to some universal stuff. Again, everything is based on judgment calls. And whether or not the block needs to be bored. Oh, one other thing before I figure out what I'm looking at. It. On this particular engine, uh, there was, the intake manifold was off of it for a long time. And so mice or whatever built little nests in there. So when we popped the lifters out, there was all sorts of stuff, all sorts of gack in there. Well, when we cleaned it, some of that gack got down into the into the into the uh, the lifter bores, and the lifter bores are open through an oil passage. So if you've got an engine that's got signs of like really gunk, you know, gunky oil, or you've got a deal where the, you've the oil passages may be contaminated, you definitely want to knock out the oil galley plugs and flush those out. You can use uh, rifle brushes to clean them. There's a lot of different ways. But take your time and get all of the oil passages as clean and as straight as possible. Honing. Okay. I'll go back to judgment calls. When does an engine need to be bored? When does it need to be honed? All right. The rule of thumb. Here, come around this way. Okay. The rule of thumb. Here's my thumb. Is that if you can catch your thumbnail on the ridge, it needs to be bored. All right, that's a really, uh, uh, um, that's what we're looking for. That's a really broad way of, you know, because define catching your thumb on it. Yeah, I can feel it with my thumb, but it doesn't stop my thumbnail, right? As a rule of thumb, if the shadow from the, from the top ring is even around the top, and you've got no more than, let's say, five thousandths, six thousandths of, of an inch ridge there, you can hone it. Now, here's where we get into some controversial stuff. Every time we do one of these videos, you get these people, use a ridge reamer on it, use a ridge reamer. Do not 
use a ridge reamer. A ridge reamer is a tool that comes from the earliest days of the internal combustion engine. When engines would get re-ringed after like 50 or 60,000 miles because the materials weren't quite up to snuff yet and the oils were not quite up to snuff. So engines, it was normal for an engine to build a huge ridge at the top. In order to get the piston out, you had to cut that ridge to get the piston out. This circumstance does not exist in anything you're going to work with in the modern era. They still sell these things. People still use them. I don't know why, but people still use them. If you're, oh, wait, I'll go back to this in a second. Um, if you're going to just save the engine by honing it, do not remove that ridge. I'll get to that in a second. One of the other determinations as to whether or not you're going you're gonna to have to deal with this ridge or if it's a problem and the engine has to be bored is whether or not you're changing the crankshaft, the stroke of the crankshaft, the length of the connecting rod, or the piston, where the piston rings are sitting in a, in a different spot. In our case, we're using the original crank, we're using the original rods, and we're using the original pistons. So those rings are going to end up in exactly the same spot. They're not going to overlap that ridge. They're not gonna, they, they won't have to deal with climbing that ridge, even though it's just a couple of thousandths of an inch. So keep that in mind. So now, why do you not use a ridge reamer? Why do you not mess with the top of this cylinder? A cylinder is only absolutely positively true in two places. So you take an engine that's got a million miles on it. It's only true, the bore is only true in two places. The very top of the bore, where it intersects the deck, this is because the piston never, never, the ring never sweeps into this area, so that's true. And because it's surrounded by the iron of the deck, it's also, it's not going to, to well, there might be a little bit of distortion when it's under load, but this will measure true. That's the original bore of the engine. And then underneath, uh, below the section that the rings ride. And in this engine here, you can see where the dirt is here. Right? I don't know if I, I can see that. Okay, that's going to be true also. If you're going to hone the engine, those two points are your guide for the hone. The hone. Hone. Another one. Oh, just use a dingleberry hone on it. One, two, three, and it's done, right? The difference between a fixed stone hone like this and a dingleberry. You know, I don't even own a dingleberry. You know why? Because they're completely useless for this type of job. So I'll represent the dingleberry with this toilet bowl brush. And you can get just about exactly the same accuracy out of wrapping this toilet, paper, this toilet bowl brush with some sandpaper and just spinning it in there as you can with a dingleberry hone. Now, I'm not saying that dingleberry hones are bad to have a place. Like, for instance, between rounds, when we run into the top fuel cars, between rounds, you're not going to change, if you're not going to change the liners, you're not going to change the pistons, you're just going to re-ring it real quick and send it back down the track. You use a dingleberry hone for a quick finish so the ring seat and the oil has a place to be stuck to the cylinder wall. The dingleberry hone, by its nature, has no structure. So if you've got a cylinder wall, let's say slightly, uh, you know, out of, out of round, that dingleberry hone will just into those it, it won't do anything to true the cylinder where if you're careful you can true the cylinder with this and you want to travel from the top right you don't want to go any, any further past that and always start your job with a fresh set of hones so you want to go from the top to the bottom Top, bottom, top, bottom, like that. And always, here, I'll, let me just kick this on real quick. By the way, I use gasoline as a cutting fluid. If that freaks you out, you can use a light oil. There's lots of different things you can use. But I find that gasoline, it, it works the best. It gives you the cleanest cut. Now you don't want to go too far, you want to stop right there. Because now you're going to know, now you're going to tell what the story is on the cylinder. Let me get a rig. A little gas. Let's clean this real quick. 
And now you can get an idea what's going on with this solar. And we see that we've got just a little ridge and it appears to be pretty much even all the way around. But we've got a scuff mark here. This is a low spot. And we've got another little low spot down there. Each individual cylinder is going to be treated, you know, by itself. So now what we'll do is take a ring. Put it on top here. Well, like so. Okay. Do this in the ridge, at the very top of the cylinder, the part of the, the bore that you know is true. That's where you want to center this thing. And you can, you can use a piston to true it up like that. Don't go too far, I went too far with that. I use a dirty piston, and you, but this is just demonstration, right? So then what you do is, yeah, I'm making a mess out of things. What, what you do is, with the piston up here in the ridge part that you know is true, shine a light from underneath. If you don't see any gap, you don't see any light between the ring and the cylinder wall, you know that the ring is round and the top of the cylinder bore is round. Now, what you do is you take your, you, you take your piston and you move the ring down about an inch and you do the same thing. Take a light from underneath, shine the light up and look between the ring and the cylinder wall. If you don't see any light there, keep going. You don't have to go any further than where the rings, the bottom of the rings uh, ride. And in our case, it, it, this is a three and a half inch stroke motor. So we've got to go three and a half inches down before we, you know. But at any rate, that's where we're at here. And we're going to shine a light underneath. And we're going to look for any gap, any light that's shining between the ring and the cylinder wall. If you don't see any light at that point, now you can go ahead and finish your honing. The important thing when you're honing the engine is to make sure that you, you're, you're incorporating the very top of, this, of the bore here, which we know is true, and the bottom of the bore. Keep those stones between those two points and you can absolutely be guaranteed that everything in between as you're honing it is going to follow those guides. That's the key to getting it done right. So, Again, lots of tedious, time-consuming stuff ahead of us. Um, and, you know, you check each cylinder. Check each ring. Now, if you're taking them new out of the box like this, it's fine. If you're going to reuse your rings, by the way, here, just, just as an example, here's a, we're talking about reusing rings. So here's, here's an original ring out of the engine, and here's a brand new one out of the box. And if you were to measure these, you would see that there is, they're exactly the same. They have the same tension. Um, the used ring in this case is just, it's ready to drop back in. Um, that's not always the case. Why would I choose to use the, well, now wait, let, let's, let's define something. I buy old rings. I got, I got rings for all my engines and I go and I buy old packages, stuff I know is 20, 30 years old. I don't buy new ones unless it's absolutely necessary. I'm buying a high dollar ring, like a stainless ring or a molly ring. But if I'm just using cast rings, I go with older stuff. And the reason for that is that since we know that the dimensions of this are correct and the tension of this is correct, we know that the metallurgy is correct. This ring lasted 100,000 miles, whatever it is, it didn't show any wear. It's all good. I can throw this back in with confidence. New ring, I don't know its history. I don't know what part of East Bongo Squeegee it came from. I don't know which 11 year old girl, you know, ran the machine that made these things. I don't necessarily trust new parts. There's been too much goofiness going on. So, you know, whether you're doing it to scrape, you know, every last dime out of your build, or you're doing it just to, you know, hey, let's just use good known parts. Just check what you've got, measure it, if it measures within spec, if it's got tension, if you check it in the bore and you don't see any light, meaning that it's, it's worn evenly all the way around, it's okay to reuse them. So, that's it. Back to work, and I'll see you tomorrow.